All right, so um, hi everybody. My name is uh, Jim Del Grosso. I work for a company called Sigital. Um, my entire focus in life is actually software security. It's all I do. And I've been fortunate enough to be focusing on security for the last seven and a half years at Sigital, and then prior to that, about seven years at a small little startup company that <clears throat> um, we had to be secure or, well, effectively the company wouldn't have existed. So it's kind of where I, I learned about security. And I've been really focused on making software secure from the design point of view for the last 15-ish years. And so today we're going to just talk about some of the, hopefully, problems that you come up against <clears throat> when we try to develop so software that is secure by design. So. Um, I think this is showing up in a different, uh, in a different talk, but certainly if you look at the, uh, uh, the bottom, it's a typical SDLC, right? They should be uh, different aspects of, of the software development lifecycle that should be near and dear to, to everybody. Across the top are security touch points. This is uh, something that Gary McGraw, our, our CTO, uh, created back in 2006. And it's just a way of taking software security activities and layering them across an SDLC. Where we are today, or where architecture analysis plays one of the most important roles, is at the beginning of a piece of software development. Um, optimally, we'd love to do you know, architecture analysis at the beginning of a project. However, not all software is being built. Some of it exists. And if you haven't done architecture analysis on a piece of software that exists, it is entirely likely there are flaws in that software that you just don't know about. So it is perfectly valid to do architecture analysis on a system that is built. I can promise you that that works because we do this all the time for our customers. It is a perfectly valid analysis to do anywhere across the SDLC. It's just way more cost effective if you do it at the beginning. But you can do it anytime. So this has also shown up earlier um, early today. Um, everybody knows that the world of software defects is made up of bugs and flaws, right? There are, and it's about 50-50 uh, across the split, and there are different techniques for finding bugs versus flaws. So when we think about bugs, what are, what are some of the typical bugs that you would most likely think of if someone says there's a bug in your software? Anything? Yeah, correct, yeah, pick any of your top end lists, right? Any top end list that's documented, these are the types of bugs that are most likely existing out there. So in fact, we do have things like cross-site scripting, and some of the typical techniques that are used to find the bugs that are out there are things like code review and pen testing. Now you can see the lines bleed over into flaws and that's because you will stumble across flaws when you're doing code review, certainly manual, and you will stumble across flaws when you're doing penetration testing. But for the most part, they're finding bugs for you. They're finding how a piece of software is just not functioning correctly, right? It's somehow implemented wrong. There's a totally different type of analysis that has to be done to find flaws, right? I can say I'm using a cable lock to secure my laptop, but if I do it that way, I'm not really securing my laptop, right? I'll pick up the table and steal your laptop. Now, I'd say that that's not a real picture, but that's a real picture that somebody was using to secure their laptop. Not all security controls are created equal. Some security controls are weak. Sometimes security controls are missing. So when we start to look for flaws in software, we want to look for how things are built insecurely. This is just a, a simple little example. Now you'll also see that architecture analysis bleeds into bugs, and that's because when we're doing architecture analysis, if we have a system that's built, we are going to look at the actual code that was used to build the system, and we will stumble across bugs. But for the most part, architecture analysis is focusing on finding flaws, other activities focus on finding bugs. Okay, <clears throat> so just some concrete examples so you can wrap your head around <clears throat> what, what these techniques are supposed to find. If I think, or if I talk about a, crypt, a cryptography bug, what we're talking about is an actual implementation problem in a piece of code. So there have been some, you know, pretty recent re revelation, revelations about how some open source software was done incorrectly, and it's happened over the, over the years. When there's bugs in the implementation of a crypto library or crypto primitive, that's the world of bugs. The world of flaws <clears throat> is I could have a perfectly valid piece of crypto code, 
But if I've written a piece of crypto code and it's a confidentiality control, but it's meant to prevent tampering, that's the wrong control. So again, imagine you're, you have your code review hat on. You look at a perfectly good piece of confidentiality code. It's 256 AES encryption. It's doing all the right things with initialization vectors. It's very good code. If you're trying to create a tamper-proof protection now, it's the wrong security control. That's a, that's a flaw in the design. The code review is not going to find that. Right? It's a perfectly good piece of code. It's just the wrong security control. Oh, sorry. Uh, the other thing that comes up when, with crypto, um, of course, <clears throat> um, crypto is a great way that people, um, I don't want to say malicious developers, but maybe developers that are, are, don't really know what they're doing, they try to hide poor designs by saying we're going to encrypt things and therefore protect ourselves. That's not what crypto is, is good for. Right? Crypto is not good for hiding poor designs. It just makes it not readable. It's still, not, it's still a poor design. And of course, another big problem that shows up with, um, in the cryptography world for flaws is, is a, the whole thing about key management. Lots of things to go wrong when we start talking about key management. How key rotation is going to happen? How do we deal with different versions of encrypted data? These are design flaws, right? How, that, how the design of the software makes use of key management and key rotation. These are big problems to solve. Authentication. <clears throat> Again, if you think about the classic or some of the typical types of authentication bugs, things like an LDAP injection, right? Some, there's just something wrong uh, with the way a query is being done to an LDAP store, and I as an attacker can supply the right data and get access to different, um, well, I can make things come back true from the LDAP store that are in fact not true. A flaw though, and, and these are <clears throat> for the most part taken from things that we've seen in real life, this is where somebody designs an authentication mechanism that looks good on the surface, but in fact, once you go through what appears to be a good secure authentication mechanism, there's then <clears throat> you know, some poor decisions that are made. Um, in this particular example, um, there was good authentication to prove you're who you are, but then there was a client-side check that actually sent the hard-coded set of credentials off to the server. So as an attacker, as long as I supplied a valid initial account, I could then tamper with the data that went to the server after I was authenticated as me. That's a really poor authentication mechanism. Again, if you're looking at a piece of code, you're probably not going to find it. If you're looking at a pen test, you might be able to find that, and that's where we bleed across the line sometimes, but it would take pretty good knowledge of knowing how the software was built to understand that I could do that. So again, poor, poor design. Logging is another area where we can see pretty good distinctions between bugs and flaws. So again, one of the classic log, log type of, um, of bugs is log injection, right? Any of the injection attacks are pretty much bugs. So everybody's familiar with log injection? Hopefully I'm not talking about bugs that nobody knows about. Everybody, everybody knows log injection? Okay. No? So it's okay. So uh, if there's anything that I'm saying that you don't understand, just interrupt me. So log injection, like other types of injection attacks, if an attacker can supply a piece of data, they can control the output that's going to the other side. In this case, a log file, for example. And so if you can imagine writing data to a file system, if I'm an attacker and I'm allowed to inject maybe new line characters and then start what could appear to be a new log message, I can start to pollute the log files and you start to lose the ability of saying what's the message of yours versus what's the message that came from an attacker. And that means I can start to make you look at log file entries that are completely bogus. So it's a type of way for me to control the data going to a log file. You, you need a way to know the data that you wrote to the log file versus what an attacker is maybe controlling. So that's log injection. Another bug, <coughs> um, which shows up quite a bit and is, and is pretty important uh, for some of our customers are in the financial, uh, financial services space, writing sensitive data to logs. Now that runs you know, anywhere from personal data to important business data, right? You need to be careful what you write to the logs. And so there's things you can do to mask data, uh, whether it's masking credit card data or masking account info, masking personal information. So you can mask some of this info um, but these are bugs when you're writing sensitive data to logs. Question? Why do you call it a bug? Because it seems to me that the design is wrong. I mean, someone should have committed their business to specify what can be put into the logs. 
it, 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 it is perfectly valid that there is a requirement that says it should not be done and you're not supposed to do that, but the fact that you did it and it's almost always a one line piece of code to go and fix the problem, it's not a design problem. You're calling an API, you're giving it data that you're not supposed to give it, it's not really a design flaw. You need to be able to write data to the logs. What I need to be able to do is somehow mask sensitive data that I'm gonna write to the logs. So I don't really think of that as a flaw that you're, that you're writing sensitive data to logs, it's a bug, it's an implementation problem. You need to be able to write data to logs, just not sensitive data. Yeah. So you would consider it a flaw that there's not a requirement that says to not do it? What if, is, uh, well, first of all, is that what you're saying? Internal coding standard? Yeah. So there's an internal coding standard that says don't do SQL injection. There's an internal code, no, worse. There's an internal coding standard that says we're going to use prepared statements to go talk to the database. A developer chooses to do dynamic SQL instead and introduces a SQL injection. Is that a flaw because I have a standard? The standard doesn't make it so. So these are bugs in, in the implementation, how somebody implemented a piece of code. The flaw, when we come to logging, in my mind, is I've got logs coming in from lots of different streams and I don't have some way of tokenizing similar data from different business units or from different applications and I don't have a way to pull that data in from different spots, normalize it and tie pieces of data from different, different applications all back to the same basically root data. So having no way to have log aggregation is a flaw because now I don't have an easy way to do forensics. And that, that's, to me, one of, the, one of the better examples of how we get flaws in our systems. Not being able to go back in time and see how a system has been broken into because we can't, log, we can't do log aggregation, that's, kind of, that's a design problem. We need to be able to have that ability. Does that make sense? Kind of? Okay. So, how do we find flaws? <coughs> Well, we could try to do code reviews. And again, code reviews will stumble across some flaws. Um, probably the most obvious uh, example where a code review can stumble across flaws will be in the crypto world. Um, when you're looking at um, crypto primitives and you're seeing how the crypto code is written, you will discover things like key management issues. These are design flaws. Um, but generally, it's going to be very hard to do that with any kind of a tool. Tools don't understand design. They're very good at understanding patterns of code, but that's not where design flaws live. So tools are generally not going to find it. Manual review, maybe, but really edge cases. What about pen testing? Same problem. Um, we have great tools to do penetration testing. They have no idea what the root cause of a problem might be they might be able to show, you know, to, to, to discover that there's a cross-site scripting problem. They will have no way of knowing that you're not, in fact, using an API correctly that could have saved you. They will have no way of knowing that you're not using your approved library for doing output encoding. The, the tools don't generally know that. They're not that good. I, I know the vendors claim that they're that good, but they're not that good. Not in general. So really we need, a different, um, we need a different type of analysis, right? We need a type of analysis that is focusing on finding the flaws that is in fact not going to be code-based. It's gonna be looking at the design of the system. And so there are some techniques for doing that. And these are the three that we're gonna talk about a little bit today. So there's dependency analysis, there's known attack analysis, and there's system-specific analysis. Um, we'll go into detail for each of these. Um, the reason that they're looping into each other is these are three very independent types of analysis. Um, they don't really feed into each other. You don't, you don't do one and then the other. Um, so they're independent types of analysis. They can all be done in parallel. They're not equal parts. It's not a third, a third, a third. Different systems will have more focus on dependency analysis. Others will be focusing on known attack analysis. And again, when we see what those are, hopefully that will make sense. But these are the three types of analysis. So, first one to talk about, dependency analysis. Any developers in here? Okay, well, about half-ish. 
So um, I, as you know, most of the software that gets built and deployed is not yours, right? It's your software is a very small sliver that sits on top of a ton of other software. Uh, some of it open source, some of it commercial, some of it, you know, vendor provided operating systems, frameworks, lots and lots of software sits between you um, and the OS. There's a lot of security concerns with the different layers. Now, <clears throat> we're not really talking about Patch Tuesday kind of, kind of vulnerability. Everybody's familiar with Patch Tuesday? Mike, okay, good. The, the lovely second Tuesday of every month. Um, from an application software security point of view, we're not terribly worried about vulnerabilities in the operating system. But up one layer, when we start thinking about middleware, and we're talking about frameworks, and we're talking about open source and commercial products, that gets a little bit more under our control. Um, we do need to be concerned about um, what versions of .NET are being used, what Java framework are we using, uh, what open source library are we using. Those types of things matter to us. And there's a couple things in particular. So there are known vulnerabilities in open source, and this is why a lot of companies keep track of approved versions of open source software. Um, you guys are familiar with NVDB and CVE? There's well-known well -known tracking of software and the vulnerabilities that exist in those things. I can promise you the bad guys are looking at those all the time. Right? They know exactly when a vulnerability comes out. Um, they know exactly how to exploit it as soon as, it's as soon as it's described and discovered, and they use that information to attack systems. So we need to know uh, which versions of our software have potential vulnerabilities. There are sometimes uh, security controls provided by the framework themselves, and sometimes those security controls are not that good. Um, anybody here .NET developers? Lived through the history from 1 to 4.5? It went from open by default to more secure by default, but there was a long road where lots of things were turned off by default in the early versions of the framework. So depending on the framework that's being used, sometimes the framework itself has vulnerabilities built into it. We need to know what those are from a development point of view and a design point of view, because we may need to build controls to basically supplement what could have been in the framework. Um, and sometimes there's just features um, in the framework that ought to be disabled, right? The frameworks provide lots and lots of capabilities. We don't need everything turned on necessarily. So we were gonna look for ways to turn off functionality that we don't use, right? The less functionality provided that we don't need, the less the chances for a piece of you know, malicious software to do something bad, right? We're reducing the footprint. So we wanna configure the software to be more secure. So how does this show up in, in real life? Well, let's look at crypto as an example. So anybody here using JCA? It's, it's just, what, it's a low-level API. The thing is, various implementations of JCE have their own quirks and vulnerabilities. A piece of software that runs perfectly fine on one JCE and one platform might be vulnerable in another platform, might be vulnerable with another JCE implementation. It just depends on the environment. So you have to be careful, or at least aware, um, if you have libraries that are deemed to be you know, secure um, and they're using certain versions of JCE, for example, you need to make sure that you're, you're using one of those secure versions, right? They're not all created equal. Jazz, it's just a framework, right? It's an API for doing authentication and authorization. It doesn't actually say how it's getting done. So you couldn't just look at Jazz and say, well, you know, we have, on, we have a good authentication and authorization me mechanism. You have no idea. It depends how it's being actually, how it's implemented. So again, from a design point of view, not enough info. If you look at input validation and output encoding, frameworks, um, some frameworks provide certain capabilities. So for the .NET gang, um, you have things like .NET uh, validate request. Um, I was, who was .NET? Do you, so do you know how exactly that works? Uh, no. So it's a very good blacklist. Now for those that you know, do security. If you had a choice between whitelisting data and blacklisting data, what would you prefer to do? You'd prefer to whitelist. So it's, it's a powerful built-in free utility or free capability of the framework, but it's a blacklist utility. And there have been known issues to circumvent, uh, to circumvent validate requests. Um, anybody using OWASP SAPI? 
So if you're actually using it, have you come across hurdles with using it? What's one of the primary hurdles of using it? So what was the, so performance, I can't help. Uh, what about the, what was the tr training issue? So those are in, in the in the pool of things that are that are difficult with this appy. Those are uh, those are kind of in the easy bucket. How do you know when to call which encoding mechanism and when? So the the hardest thing to do to prevent cross-site scripting is knowing when to encode data for a particular context. The SAPI does not help that. You have to still know when to make all the appropriate HTML attribute encodings, HTML encodings, URL encodings, when you need to do both. Mm -hmm. so, so, what was it? Actually, actually, it's just, um, just another slide again, because I have to encode it just before you output it to some kind of portal. Right, the, so the, the context. You absolutely can't do it ahead of time. You need to do it when you're about to send it to the output. But the hard part with cross-site scripting is knowing that I'm about to put this data, for, well, A, I need to know that it's from an untrusted source, right? Because I, I didn't control this data from its origin. So understanding the origin of the data is difficult. And then for all the different contexts, if the data is going into a URL, if it's going into an attribute, if it's going into just HTML, so on and so on, all the, all the different contexts, I have to encode it for that context. This appy has output encoders, but it doesn't tell me when I'm supposed to call each. If I've got you know, a URL as part of an HTML attribute, it doesn't help me that I need to double encode it, right? Once for URL and once for HTML attribute. It doesn't, doesn't do that. So this is a, a bug now. Now we, we are at a, a security mistake that's in a single line of code. We are no, no, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, right, right. So when we, talk about, when we talk about dependency analysis from a flaw, you can't just say I'm using this API and therefore I don't need to worry about this because your thinking might be that this is the control I'm going to put in place in order to prevent cross-site scripting. And that is not true. Your implementation that it's, yes, it's difficult to get that right. So if you take a step back, it's how do we design our system so that we can help get it right? And you look for alternatives. Or you build something into you know, your, your model that you have a framework that's going to make the right calls at the right places. But the actual implementation of not encoding at the right place at the right time, that, that instance is kind of a bug, but relying on a tool as the control that's going to prevent something when it in fact doesn't is the flaw. Yeah. Make sense, everybody? Okay. Um, oh, sandboxing. <clears throat> so, Again, sometimes we look at this idea of you know, sandboxed environments and a piece of software is gonna run in a protected little universe and not be able to bust out of that sandbox. Anybody actually believe that? In the, in the versions of browsers that we have, it's, it's not true, right? We, we break out of sandboxes. I don't wanna say all the time, but there's, there's patches that are done to browsers on a semi-regular basis. And sometimes when you read the details of what went wrong, there was some flow through the browser logic that caused you to bust out of the sandbox and do things you're not supposed to do. So again, we need to be careful when we look at some of these controls and just assume that they're always going to work, that they're always going to be there. Um, for the JavaScript same origin policy, it's pretty well defined how the same origin policy works. However, there's lots of ways to bypass it, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have rampant cross-site scripting. Yep. Again, does that kind of make sense? Okay. So it's the dependency analysis. <clears throat> uh, second type of analysis that helps find flaws is known attack analysis. So um, as security people, we have to understand and know how, um, how basically flaws and how, sec how security weaknesses exist in software. The bad guys have all of that knowledge and more, right? These are the guys, their entire job is to do this kind of research to figure out how to break into things. Much of it gets published. Right when one of their breaches goes goes mainstream, and we hear about how 
how some breaking occurred. <clears throat> but we need to understand all the ways that software can be vulnerable. So we have things like the OS top 10, SANS 25, pick your top end list. Um, there's lots of good documentation <clears throat> on how well, uh, how known attacks work. We need to know about those attacks because when we're building our software, we're going to obviously make sure that our software is not going to be vulnerable to the known attacks because that's going to be one of the first thing attackers are going to try. In fact, there's tools, of course, that automate much of this, right? There's tools that they can point at a, at a website or, an, or, an, or any kind of an API and launch a series of attacks against your software and they have very little work to do. They're using all the known attacks that, 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 are, that are documented and they're going to launch those attacks against you to see if you're vulnerable to these, to these types of attacks. So this is the first part of, of known attack analysis. Um, so just some, again, just some examples of defects that are, you know, popping up in air quotes around often, just the kinds of things that we, we see quite a bit. Um, Client-side trust, unfortunately, is, is, is wildly popular. Um, it seems that we've gone back um, almost a decade in software security and forgotten that the client can't be trusted. Um, this is maybe due to mobile, it's maybe due to um, thicker client software. Um, you know, thank you Flash and other technologies that, that run on the client side that people seem to forget that that piece of software actually runs in a completely untrusted environment. Um, so we have client side trust issues. Um, there's missing and weak controls. We talked about some of these, you know, logging and auditing. And of course, there's others, um, other types of, of missing or weak controls. Session management. Again, well, well known, well known defects. Um, and of course, there's things like KPAC. Anybody familiar with the website KPAC? Common attack pattern, enumeration, and classification. It's a, it's a website that um, just documents um, all of, or not all, but a, a, a whole set. I think it's org, it's MITRE. Um, we originally started uh, this list and then it was taken over by uh, Department of Homeland Security, so it's uh, maintained by them now but it's a common attack pattern enumeration classification. It's actually an okay laundry list of attack patterns, ways of breaking into software. Just to get you thinking <clears throat> about all the well-known attacks that bad guys are using to try to break into your, into your stuff. So again, it's just it's background info. Well, well-known well -known attacks against your software. So again, these are just, uh, just some examples. So just to, again, we're gonna just to go through some more examples of how known attacks apply in different parts of a typical uh, enterprise type application. We're going to look at five different areas. Um, basically, a, you know, an application that's distributed in nature, one that's using dynamic code generation, uh, one that's doing um, APIs across stateless protocols. We'll look uh, at RAA, and then we'll also look at uh, a SOA for just a second. So if we look at a distributed system, <coughs> If I told you that we were going to go look at the design of a application that was distributed in nature, there should be a set of common attacks that you should automatically think of. So these are just some of them. So we've got our, you know, two pieces. Basically, we have our, you know, two, two components, if you would, running, right? We've got our server, we've got our client, and we have some attacker sitting in the middle. So as soon as we know we have a distributed uh, a uh, piece of software running in some system, we have these types of attacks. So everybody familiar with eavesdropping, right? So an attacker is listening in on, on the data that's, <coughs> um, that, that's traveling down the wire. Tampering, of course, right? They're intercepting the data, tampering with it, putting it back on the wire. These are interposition attacks, man in the middle, however, whatever name you're using. Um, the spoofing of the data, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make myself look at the endpoint that you think you want to talk to. Right? Again, we have two endpoints, two components. So I'm going to try to spoof one of the ends. I can hijack the connection, and I can also observe. So there's a subtle difference between observing and eavesdropping. Anybody want to venture a guess as to what the diff is? Right. So one is intelligently being able to, uh, to see it versus I'm watching the traffic go. So maybe it's encrypted somehow. Um, different types of attack when you can not understand the data. You can still do some interesting things by watching, you know, how the, what kind of payload is going down the wire, but a totally different type of attack. 
So again, as soon as, oh, sorry. That they were just observing? Well, looking at the metadata, I think, is different than, than observing because they were actually reading. I think their claim is you sent, um, you know, you sent a, a thousand bytes of data and we only looked at the first 50, which was the metadata. We didn't actually look at the other 950. I don't, A, believe them. And, and even if I did, I, how did they carve out? I think it was really they got different streams, and so they, I mean, it'll be good for, when is that talk tomorrow? Uh, the the post-Snowden one, it'll be interesting to see. So, yeah, when that, when that gets, the details of that. So, um, yeah, I, I view metadata as different, because metadata, you're typically reading the metadata. You can see it all. You don't, you don't have details, but you do have readable data. But, but again, as soon as we have a distributed piece of software, certain sets of attacks all of a sudden make sense. If I have uh, code generation, so when we talk about uh, dynamic code generation, what are some typical attacks that come to mind, right? If your software is dynamically generating code, what's an attacker possibly going to be doing? I mean, pick your word and stick it in front of injection. All right, whether it's SQL injection, LDAP injection, XML injection, anytime there's some sort of dynamic parsing of information, I, as an attacker, I'm going to try to control the actual command that's going to execute in a bunch of different contexts, whatever that may be. Um, with the dynamic parsing on the client side with JavaScript, I have access to, a, again, a full language compiler that if I can control the data that you're going to feed into the JavaScript compiler, things get interesting to me, or might get interesting to me. So how our application takes that code and then, of course, executes it gets very interesting from an attacker's point of view. And again, we, we just know that because in this environment, we know that there is dynamic code execution that's happening. As soon as we have dynamic code execution, a certain set of alarms should trigger, and we need to be worried about certain types of vulnerabilities. APIs across stateless protocol. So what's one of the most common APIs across stateless protocols? I'm sorry? Uh, so REST is a big one, yep. Even broader than, broader than that. I mean, just a typical, typical website, right? HTTP is a stateless protocol. If you communicate with the website, they have to somehow recognize that I'm talking to the website versus you. What's it typically doing to understand it's me versus somebody else? What, it's got some sort of, yeah, it's got some sort of session thing that's being stored oftentimes in a cookie. And so as soon as we know that there is some piece of data being used to maintain state, there's a set of attacks that need to come into our brain. And so we need to worry about things like, is there some way for the attacker to predict this identifier that's gonna be used to identify me versus you? Is somebody gonna be able to capture it is someone going to be able to generate a perfectly valid token, but then hand it off to somebody else, and when they start to communicate with you, I now know this unpredictable token, and you can't tell the difference between me and the attacker. That's really what session fixation is. So these are, again, standard kinds of attacks that come into play when we know we have this stateless protocol and we have to make these API calls. So beyond session management, though, can you think of any other example where you're maintaining state who? Gaming. gaming. Uh, so gaming is maintaining uh, a bunch of information of, it is maintaining a type of state. <clears throat> um, I don't know that it's necessarily maintaining it across API calls. Um, it might be more complicated than that, but it's, but it's certainly possible. So imagine I have some workflow that I'm supposed to progress through. And the more I, you know, the deeper I get into my progression, I have maybe, I don't know, I have some security control there and I have some security control there. And then when I do here, I go and do something really interesting. And I'm, I'm maintaining what state I'm, 
I'm in of this workflow. What's, what's your goal if you're an attacker? Yeah, jump to five. <laughs> right? I don't care about all of these things. Is there some way for me to get to here without you being able to detect it and I've bypassed all your nice security controls? Uh, another way that this plays out in real life is as you attempt to work backwards through the state and there's you know, cleanup code and there's cleanup code and there's cleanup code through each of these transitions because that's the normal flow. Again, if I'm a malicious user, can I jump to here and you know, skip some of this cleanup code and do you get into some weird unstable state? Things haven't cleaned up after themselves and now I can move forward in some weird and interesting way. So when we have these flows, when we have these APIs across stateless protocols, there's just what, there's known attacks that we need to consider when we're designing our system. Obviously, we don't want to allow anybody to jump to five. We want to make sure that if we're coming back to some state, you know, from a, from a previous state, we do the proper cleanup as we work backwards, whatever that may be. But that's the kind of things, those are the kinds of things we need to think about just because we know we have a, soft, a piece of software designed a certain way. Sure. So this will totally depend on uh, if we're doing design versus, you know, a brand new greenfield versus existing. If it's uh, an existing system, it's how did the developer and architect choose to, you know, create the system. If it's brand new design, then we're going to consider, you know, fairly obvious things. We're never going to allow any of the state information to be stored client side without it being you know, at least verified or probably stored server side. When we do any kind of backward flow, we're gonna, you know, again, whether this even makes sense, the first question would be, do we need to allow that or do you always just jump back to one? Why do you need to maintain where you are? Uh, but if you are working backwards, you know, it's gonna be you know, some sort of state information that's most likely stored server side, probably stored in, a, in a, you know, some sort of a data store. Well, no. If, well, if you're designing a system and you want to you wanna create a secure workflow, you're going to design a state, basically a state storage mechanism that's always stored in a place where an attacker can't tamper with it. So whenever we come to, you know, if, we, if someone were to jump to state five, we're going to have information on the server side that knows what state they were coming from, which in this example was two. And when they try to jump to five, it's the server that will, I mean, that's the security control we're gonna build in at the design that says we're never gonna allow you to jump here from an, un, an invalid state. So it'll still be, it'll still be the, at the design yeah. stage, and then you choose how to implement that and whatever makes sense. But no, it'll, it happens on the design side. Um, and of course, the other thing to, uh, that we're going to test for um, there's this concept of idempotent. No matter how many times you do something, it has no weird side effects. So, you know, what happens if somebody just keeps landing on, you know, a particular state or can send something to you uh, 100, 1,000 times that says, well, put me in state three, put me in state three. You know, are you constantly doing something that, again, creates some weird, unstable um, environment that maybe has some interesting side effects from a software security point of view? So multiple, t multiple, you know, multiple calls to the same thing, no harm, not allowed to jump to invalid states, not allowed to go backwards. Again, just kind of standard things that should come into mind just because of a particular way that we're using the system. Make sense? Okay. So RIA. Um, so Web 2.0 and, and the move of, of pushing a lot of uh, functionality off to the client has resurrected uh, client-side trust issues, at least in much of what, of what we're seeing. Um, there's now a shift of information that's, uh, that's happened and it's gone over to the client side. And we have things like, uh, again, new, uh, basically new compilers, new processing engines over here that have, have software that's not easy to look at. I mean, the tools are getting actually a lot better at being able to uh, you know, to manipulate this data pretty easily. Um, for anyone that's using, you know, some of the tools out there, um, Charles and even Burp now have, uh, they basically have, uh, they, can, they can decompose Flash 
interactively, so you can modify all the Flash client side, which is kind of nice. Um, but it's not just that. Uh, with HTML5, we've got local storage that allows you to store data over here. And again, if I'm a malicious user, that's, that's perfectly viable for me to go manipulate and do whatever I want with. Depending on how you choose to use that, um, I might be able to do interesting things. So again, as, as we're just the design of the system, as we're starting to, uh, not starting, but as we're moving this data off to the client, uh, we need to be thinking about these well-known attacks and what is an attacker possibly able to do, right, just because of the design of the system. And any questions on this? Okay. And then the, the, fifth, uh, the fifth type of uh, design element, uh, which, is on, which is for SOA, again, it introduces uh, just known, some perfectly well-known attacks. So if we've got web services that are being called, if we've got some sort of messaging middleware, if we've got some sort of an enterprise service bus, um, if we think about, you know, messaging middleware, uh, service buses where messages are traveling down some pipe, uh, they're temporarily being stored somewhere, there's a store and forward mechanism that's in play, um, how does a store and forward mechanism actually guarantee delivery of the data? It accepts the data, possibly writes it somewhere, maybe to disk, and then sends the data off to its final, final endpoint. <coughs> What can happen when that data is sitting on disk? Depends who has access to it. But if you haven't at least thought about it and, and thought about who can get access to that, things get interesting. Who can put messages on the queue? Well, depending on how you've configured the queue, uh, <coughs> somebody on the network segment, somebody being a piece of software on the network segment, might be able to access the queue and put messages on there. Again, it's it's really a, a publish and a subscribe mechanism. People are reading messages off the queue. Uh, if I can get to the queue as a malicious piece of software, I can start to send messages that didn't really come from who you thought the messages came from. Uh, so that maybe gets kind of interesting. <clears throat> you have to think about um, channel security, <clears throat> security between two endpoints versus message security. Um, is this message traveling between multiple systems and do I want to actually protect the message between the two you know, the beginning and the end, no matter how many systems it hops through, or do I protect a channel between each endpoint? What's the big difference between channel security versus message security? What can happen every time the message is decrypted before it goes on to the next endpoint? Right. I have, I, have, I have new places that I have to think about every time that that message has been decrypted, can something go wrong? If I've got it between the two endpoints, my message is encrypted no matter where it's stored, and maybe in fact that satisfies some compliance requirement of yours, that the data be encrypted while it's you know, in storage or transmitting across two endpoints that you don't really know all the systems in between. So again, these are just because of the, you know, um, uh, how a piece of software is designed, these are standard attack patterns that you would want to think about. Okay, third, third type. Um, System-specific analysis. It's kind of a weird name, um, but these are the, this is the type of analysis that is going to hopefully find flaws in the system that are not going to be found. They're not well-known attacks. They're not, they're not framework issues. They're not underlying software issues. These are problems in the software that exist just because of how you built the software. So has everybody, everybody heard of uh, emergent property of software? You build a piece of software, it works perfectly fine. You, you've probably seen this if you've developed software. You build a piece of software in your little test environment, works great. Another person builds a piece of software in their environment, works great. Put the two pieces of software together, many times in a production environment, they don't work great some emergent property has now happened because the software is working together. <clears throat> this strives to find those kind of problems. So how do we do it? All right, so these are just some examples. Um, whenever we see things like custom protocol, custom authentication mechanism, pretty much the word custom, things are usually interesting. Doing things custom has an excellent chance of doing them wrong or insecurely. So a weakness in a custom protocol is good. Um, things can go wrong with you know, how, how systems choose to do authentication. Sometimes uh, we get credentials that are being reused 
by different systems for totally different purposes. Again, there's a, there's a data store of authentication credentials, but those are being used for very different purposes and there's no marrying of the, of the two systems as to what you're supposed to be able to do in each of the systems. It's just proving you're who you are. Uh, so that can get kind of interesting. And then of course, the other, the other big problem, and this was um, ironically uh, a good chunk of this morning's talk, is that you're not following software design principles. So uh, the Salzer and Schroeder paper is, is extremely well known. It's uh, morphed a little bit um, into, uh, the, we actually, uh, there's, there's an article on the 13 principles. There's, I, I think the original one was 10 or 11, I forget. Um, we follow 13. So I'm not gonna go through these. Um, if you're interested, there's an article online about it. Again, these slides will be up on the, on the, on the website. But if you look at some, uh, most of these, uh, I think they came out this morning. Hopefully they make good sense. Um, attackers are lazy. They are not gonna try to break some, you know, I don't know, 1024 crypto key if they can do something much simpler. It's like your house that has a steel door with uh, 25 locks on it, but you leave the window open. And a burglar is gonna come through the window, right? They're not coming through that reinforced steel door. Uh, hackers are no different. Uh, obviously, you know, defense in depth, multiple security controls of different types, making it more difficult for an attacker to break into your system. And again, you, these are just good design principles. So if we're looking at a system, we look for opportunities where was a design principle implemented or was it skipped? And we find many of these are not done in practice. Um, it's still surprising how just things like least privilege uh, with access to systems is not, is just not done. Credentials to systems are reused for very different purposes. I get it's convenient. I get it's convenient to have a single config file or properties file that has the keys to access something else. But when, a pe when two pieces of software access the same thing for very different reasons, that's a least privilege problem. They, don't have, they should not have the same access to things. These are not gonna be found by code review. They're very likely not gonna be found by pen tests. They only get found and discovered when there's a breach and then the piece of software that was able to break through some, what should have been a harmless piece of software, can actually do a lot of damage because they're sharing credentials that, have, that are very powerful. These are design problems that you have to find through different type of analysis. <coughs> All right, <coughs> so quickly, um, just to talk about threat modeling. When, when we do the system specific analysis, one of the types of, um, one of the very specific types of analysis that we do is threat modeling. And in fact, on Wednesday, uh, there's a two session that we're going to build a threat model on a make-believe app. It's got built-in flaws, and we'll spend the two sessions actually creating a model of the system and figuring out where the flaws are. Um, we're gonna just quickly go through an example of that just to, again, just so you can understand um, how this analysis can help find flaws in software. So just briefly, some terminology. Um, when we talk about threat modeling, we talk about threat agents, we talk about assets, we talk about the attack, the attack surface, um, the goal of the attack, and then the security control. So threat agent is the code, the person that means to do your system harm. That's the threat agent. The asset, the thing that needs to be protected. Um, data, functionality, whatever. Of course, the attack itself. How is the threat agent getting to the asset? There is the attack surface. <clears throat> Your system could be gigantic. There are going to be paths through the system for that threat agent to get to that asset. So that's the attack surface. Uh, they have some goal in mind. Sometimes it's a pivot. Sometimes they're trying to get to one spot so that they can launch a secondary attack. Sometimes they're just trying to get to something. So there's the goal of the attack. And then of course the security control, the thing that stands between the threat agent and the asset that is going to prevent the access. So when we're doing design work, we think about these things and make sure that we build a security control that's gonna adequately protect the asset. And when we're doing this from a review point of view, we wanna make sure that the security control is adequate to protect the asset, whatever you've built. So these, that's, those are the terms. So here's a pretty simple system. Um, make believe as it is, um, but just to quickly uh, describe it, um, we've got a browser. Um, we have a, a chemistry uh, site. There is a free area, right? No, no authorization. This is where any user would come in, where they can register for this site. 
maybe do some free searching with whatever data is being stored here. Then there's member pages. And within the member pages, there's paid pages, some sort of a premium subscription model. So uh, anybody can get to it. I got to sign up and get to the member pages, and that's the free stuff. And then there's some premium subscription kind of data. Uh, we've got a data store. We've got the identity service, which is proving who the users are. And we have our little personality test. This is a, some sort of a you know, social site. It's figuring out what kind of person you are. And this, is, this figures that out. So if we look at this kind of picture, threat agents are going to be um, those attackers or code acting on behalf of some attacker that have some malicious intent. Right? They mean to do your system harm. That is, that's what the threat agents are doing. Just like we have different users, users that have only access to the free data, users that have access to the uh, subscription pages, users that have access to the premium pages, attackers are similar in that they have different capabilities as well. There's an attacker that will be on the corporate network. There's attackers that will be out on the internet. There are attackers that will be, you know, have, basically have access inside of the data center. So these threat agents have got different capabilities within the system, and they have, of course, different goals. Uh, sometimes it might be to hide their tracks. Sometimes it's going to be to spam users. Sometimes it's going to be to steal, you know, steal PII, whatever their, whatever their goals are. Um, but these, uh, these threat agents um, live inside of this ecosystem and can do different things to different parts of the system. Does that make sense? So this is like the first part of threat modeling is figuring out who the threat agents are. We talked about assets. So as we look at this, <clears throat> assets are important functionality, important data that this application would want to protect. Now, I know we don't know a lot about this, but just from the, the brief description that, that was given, what would be hopefully some obvious assets to the system? So the paid pages, because I want to control access to that, so that's, that's an asset, right? So we've got the paid pages. What else? So there is, one would assume, somewhere in here, there's user data. I mean, it looks like this is calling into here to prove you're who you say you are. So there's going to be some sort of data in here for all the different users. What else? As soon as I have one of these, what asset do I have? What's, what's, how do I distinguish member from paid member from guest on any kind of a browser? I mean, there's some sort of session information, right, that has to make it out to here. So I've got, I've got session IDs that are living out here. So we talked about PII kind of information, probably credit card for, um, you know, paying for the, uh, for the, for the data. Uh, we, we mentioned the paid pages, and that is an asset, and so is the functionality of being able to escalate my privilege to get to, to be a paid member, right? So functionality and data are both considered assets. There's credentials and keys to access things, like databases, like FTP sites, like other systems, uh, business partners, whatever. Um, where those credentials and keys are stored is an asset. You're going to have to protect those when they're inside of your universe. You're going to have to be worried about things like where, do those, where, do, where is that information stored? Who can get to it? Who knows what, that, what those values are? <coughs> There's log files. We talked about sensitive data into log files before. Uh, that's potentially, uh, potentially interesting. We talked about program control data. That's going to be things like session ID. And of course, the users themselves can be treated um, or can be thought about as assets because when this user has access to all of this functionality, what is an attacker going to try to do? Get this user to do stuff on their behalf, right? If this user has the right to go do a bunch of things in here, I as an attacker would love for this user to go do stuff for me so that I don't have to break into the system. 
You're going to go use the system, and I'm going to just piggyback on all of your privileges and have you do stuff for me. So sometimes what the user can get to is also thought of as an asset. Does that make sense? So we've thought about the threat agents. We've thought about the assets. Now we want to think about how. How is that threat agent going to try to get to the various assets? So we put our, we've got our little assets that we hear from before, and we have our, uh, our threat agents that are here. And so we'll just populate this with some examples. So when we do threat modeling, uh, this is really the exercise. The exercise is for threats that I've considered, that I consider to be, you know, for threat agents that I consider to be, to be real, um, what are the assets they can get to? And again, we don't have to do ninja style crazy attacks. There are well-known attacks that attackers are gonna try to launch. We'll know where assets are flowing through the system and does a threat agent have the ability to try to get to that asset in our system? So we have, where's the, there it is. So we have our external you know, users that are doing Again, code injection techniques. We know, we're, we, we know part of our system is taking data from the user. Uh, we're going to look for you know, the various types of code injection. We're going to look for cross-site injection, right? Again, typical types of attacks. Um, we know we want to try to use forged requests to have this user perform actions on our behalf. We may have direct API calls into some backend services, a la REST APIs, that an attacker is going to try to um, abuse. Again, we're, we're looking at uh, the threat agents, we're looking at the assets, and we're going to think about what are the ways uh, that that threat agent is gonna try to get to that asset, and then we're going to put controls in place so that the threat agent, in fact, cannot get to the asset. And we don't have to solve the problem 100%. We need to solve the problem so that the risk is reduced to an acceptable level for us. Sometimes it's okay to not be, well, we're never gonna be 100% secure, but it's perfectly okay, it's okay to reduce the risk to an acceptable level. We just need to get the risk down to a good level. Okay. Where are we? Oh, we got a half an hour. All right, perfect. So, why, <clears throat> why is architecture analysis necessary? So, um, let me just give you an example of, of uh, of how this came out in a kind of a real life story. It's not exactly right to protect the innocent, but <clears throat> um, part of this had to do with perspective. So let me just give you an example of a system and you can tell me what's wrong with it. I have an existing application and it's got some sensitive data and there's a whole bunch of data in here and it's all encrypted because that application did not want that data to be readable by anybody else. But this data traveled around the corporate universe. No harm, no foul. App2 comes along and it needs to be able to make sure that that piece of data is valid. So imagine there's some, you know, I don't know, I don't want to call it a library. Let's just call it a, there's some class file, encrypt data. And this application group was nice enough to give the app2 group this encryption data. So yay, we get to reuse code. I didn't have to do anything, I'm working on app2. I don't, have to, I don't have to reuse, I don't have to create new code. And inside of here, um, when I get this block of data, this is my encrypted data. I decrypt this piece, and I basically then send this up to app one over HTTPS and say, is data okay? And then it would respond, yep, that's good. No, it's not good. So I didn't, have to, I didn't have to reuse any data. If I was, again, if I'm looking at this, I, I, great. I get a piece of encrypted data from you. I use your algorithm to decrypt it. 
I send it to you, you say it's good, we move on. Yeah, on the surface, it's okay. When we actually look at the code, um, inside of this class file was hard-coded IV and key. Um, crypto bunch, you know, in initialization vector and key. So, bad, right? When you have keys and initialization vectors hard-coded in things, it's, it's not good. It means anybody who gets a hold of this can and encrypt any data any time that they want. So imagine you were doing a penetration test on this. If I'm doing a penetration test on this without deep, deep understanding of what this application is doing and how this piece of data was used, this is an encrypted blob to me. I really don't, I'm not gonna, from a pen test point of view, I've got some encrypted junk, it's sent over a secure channel. Uh, it's not a lot I can, I can really, I can do with that. And it's gonna, app one is gonna tell me it's okay. Penetration testing is probably not gonna find any kind of a problem. If I'm doing a code review on this, what's gonna be my initial reaction, most likely? I've got a hard-coded key. So what would be your solution be to a hard-coded key? you're gonna create some key management solution. And so I'm gonna build something here and we're gonna do a key exchange and we'll, I got a whole bunch of pain in the neck that I have to go deal with. When you take a step back from the architecture point of view, what should be your question? Did anybody see what the, what would be your natural question if we're looking at a system that was built like this? Why do I need this at all? Can I not just give you your encrypted blob that I don't know anything about, and I can ask you, is this field in that blob okay? And you tell me if it is or isn't. And then I don't need your class file, which has got its own problems, but at least it's not my problem. You have a problem that you're gonna wanna go fix, but I don't have to deal with it. And in fact, I can keep this blob encrypted, hand it off to you, since it's your data anyway, you decrypt it and tell me if it's okay. My problems go away. Um, I don't waste my time building a key management system that was completely unnecessary, even though that is a solution for hard-coded keys. The real solution was to take a step back and see what were we doing and why, and does this make sense to work to build a system that's handing off you know, or I'm decrypting the data only to ask you if a piece of your encrypted data is valid. But, I mean, again, if you take a step back, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. There's no reason to do that. So if, if we were looking at this from the design level and somebody said, I'm going to give you a class file that's going to encrypt the data, or sorry, that's going to decrypt the data so that you can tell me if my data is valid, you have enough information to at least ask the question, can't I just give you the data? Why do I need your decryption algorithm if I'm only going to decrypt the data to give it to you to ask if it's valid? Why don't I just give you the encrypted data? So even at the design level, there's enough information there to at least ask the question. Certainly once they handed you the class file, you can have a new set of alarms going off that the implementation is not right. And now you look for a reason to not use that file anyway. So now you're still going back to, is there some way that I can change the design so that I don't need this? Because I don't like your solution. It's dangerous, I know it's dangerous. Can I get rid of this? And that should lead to the same answer. How do I get rid of my need to decrypt your data? Well, I get rid of my need to decrypt your data by giving you your encrypted stuff and you just tell me if it's okay. So I basically ask you to change the API. Yeah. Yeah, but this is where things are not gonna be found by tools, things are not gonna be found by pen tests, things, yeah. This is why you need a different type of analysis to start thinking about that. So when, 
when, when people use trigger words, I'm encrypting things, I've got you know, different components, I have business partners that are out there, alarms go off. And there's standard attacks that we want to think about and, and figure out our, you know, how are we going to mitigate the risk to our software. Well, I can mitigate the risk to my software by never decrypting it. And, and then, it doesn't mean that the, the, the data is safe, but it's not my problem from the software that I'm writing. When I do an assessment for this software, then we can, then we can drill down into the, you can't hard code keys, you need a key management solution, and it becomes an app one problem. But you could imagine if this was passed off to three or four apps, I mean, there's three or four, now there's three or four points in the system that are weak because we had this poor security control that was handed off multiple times. That's exactly where AA should stand. And so as soon as it starts to see stuff like this, it can start to ask the right questions. Why are we doing this? Don't, don't give that to anybody. It's not good. We'll just change the API and give you your data back. So but it's not that you can use a kind of fixed architectural diagram or they will use your own project yourself. It's actually by going over all the documentation, there's not the biggest questions to actually dig in the services. The docs, diagrams, yeah. Yeah, well, for us, when we work on a system that's built, it is driven an incredible amount by interviews. Yeah, by understanding, again, well, if we're doing an assessment for this app, it's by talking to these people and finding out, you know, do you ever, you know, it starts off with harmless questions. Do you use any kind of crypto library? So, yeah, um, another team gave us their crypto algorithm to use. It's like, oh, okay, <laughs> what for? <laughs> and then you drill and you drill, and eventually it leads to something interesting. But yeah, you have to, you kind of have to discover this through these other, through these other techniques. Okay, so we had the poor management example, like we just said. Penetration testing, probably would never have found it. Code reviews would have most likely flagged it as a key management problem, but the fact is it's a broken design. So again, we need to, we need to go up a, up a level. <clears throat> and this is not statistical data, it's not, or I should say it's not statistically significant data because it's not a big enough pool but anecdotal data. Um, so again, I, I, I spend uh, most of my time uh, working on either threat models or architecture risk analysis, which are what we call them at, at our space. And if we looked at um, maybe a dozen ARAs uh, across eight different clients, uh, there was <coughs> um, 150 of the 273 were flaws. Now, we mentioned before the split between flaws and bugs, and you're gonna stumble across process and, and implementation bugs when we do ARAs, this is reality. We stumble across implementation bugs, we stumble across process problems. Uh, when we're doing ARAs, we, we stumble across you know, uh, operational issues. Um, but for the most part, uh, we're finding flaws. And what we've discovered is client-side trust is, in, in our miniature sample set, that is the number one problem, is this disconnect that there is software running on the client side and there are controls built into that. Or there's sensitive data in there that is controlling state. And I don't understand why that is reared its head is number one. We all know we're not supposed to do that. We all know that client side software is, is modifiable by an attacker, but this is what we were, this is what we were seeing. It's not that it wasn't necessary. I mean, I could have stored sensitive data on the client side in a web app, but we know not to do that, right? Well, you could have known it, but it was not necessary for the technology. Well, for modern applications, it's, it's necessary to do it. For aging applications, you, you have to do client side processing. It's fine to do client side processing, but the security control itself cannot live there. Sure. But since there's so much client side processing, yeah. it's only natural to also do client side. Uh, Yes. But the models are, are more inclining you towards doing that. While for all the models, web application models, it was not the case. And I think that's, that's, that's dangerous. It's a dangerous um, um, trend, let's say. Yeah, it's, it was disturbing to have the numbers bear out as much as they were. That uh, security or client-side trust was, was number one. Um, 
Uh, number two was something else. Number three was crypto, screwing up crypto. Again, it's, there are well, in, in these particular organizations, they had well-documented standards on how to use crypto APIs. And I forgot where, in some session I was in today, it, it popped up where, you know, if you have good standards, developer will follow them. And it's just not true. <clears throat> you can have the best standards that you want out there. Um, there are technologies that are hard to get right. And crypto is a perfect example of it. It is hard to get crypto right. Um, is, is, what we're, is what we're seeing. Um, the, you screw up either the implementation, you screw up how, um, you know, even the selection. Again, the, a, a selection that's documented in the standard is not, is, not the right, is, is not the right primitive to use in all cases. So crypto is just one of these examples. We still see um, password management not being done correctly. Um, even though this is a really well understood problem and we still do not do password management correctly. Uh, again, simple, simple things that it's, it just depends on who the developers are and it doesn't seem to matter that you have good corporate standards. It, I don't know if it's an outsourcing issue, if it's a, just developer has a bad day. I don't know what the problem is. <clears throat> but again, this is what the data um, has shown for, for us. Okay, if you're going to <clears throat> uh, start, start going down the, uh, um, the AA road, there's just a couple things to keep in, uh, in the back of your, uh, back of your brain. <clears throat> so one of the first things <clears throat> to purge from your mindset is to assume things. Um, don't, don't assume that you know, the system you're looking at is hardened the way it should be. Now, this, your, these rules will be very flexible. If you're in a you know, Fortune 50 company, you can probably assume servers are, are hardened. But if you're in a Fortune 5000 or 50,000, uh, probably not. It really depends on, on the environment. Um, again, even though we know we're not supposed to you know, have controls client side or maybe send certain pieces of sensitive data to the client that doesn't need to be there, don't assume that it's not, that it's not sent there. Um, don't, if you're looking at a system that exists, again, this is a perfectly valid technique to do on, a, on an existing system. If the system has been around for a while, don't assume that the, the overall design has been looked at since the first year that it came into existence. Uh, we've worked with systems that have been around for eight, 10 years, and their design document was something like seven years old. There's no way the system has not changed in seven years. It's not possible. But documentation doesn't get updated. Um, people make small changes, right? It's just a small change to the system. It's not a big deal. Except when you take everything together, it in fact is a big deal. Um, don't assume that if you're in an organization that has a well-defined good process for how software is going to be built or how software is going to move through your ecosystem that it's going to be followed. It doesn't happen all the time. So this, this notion of assuming things is pretty bad. Um, know what's supposed to get done and then go verify that it's getting done well. Uh, because I think you'll find that there are shortcuts being taken sometimes. Maybe because there was a deadline that had to be met. Maybe because the developer really didn't understand how important it was to, do, to follow the rules. Um, but don't assume that all your, all your nice docu documented procedures are being followed. Okay, some of this stuff is, is hard. I, I, I hope this will translate here. I would assume it does. Um, there's a book for uh, describing how home electricity works. I assume that's the same here. I can read the book, and I am probably able to go do something simple in my house, like change a wall outlet, or you know, move a light switch, or do something simple. Right? I, can, I can get book smart, and I can understand the fundamentals of electricity and how certain things work. That does not mean I am ready to go you know, hook up to the grid and start working with massive electrical infrastructure, right? Just because I read a book. In order to do this, on the bottom, you go through some sort of apprenticeship, right? You build up to those skills. So that is an important aspect of this type of training, is going through this apprenticeship model, uh, lots and lots of doing. Uh, you really need to do this on a pretty regular basis. It has to just be baked into you because you will become very untrustworthy, which is good. 
you will not believe what you're told, which is good. Um, you're forced to always be thinking about what would a malicious person, what would a threat agent do? Where am I putting these assets and how can a threat agent get to them? Because when you start to think about the system in these terms, you start to keep assets in places where it's hard to get to. Do I need to have this asset sitting in this spot where it's reachable by you know, a completely different set of threat agents? These are the kinds of questions you want to ask yourself. Um, trying to do too much too soon um, is a problem. Uh, this really is about baby steps. Uh, you know, the whole notion of, of threat modeling and architecture analysis is, is pretty deep and wide. Uh, there's a lot of information that you, you need to have. And I, again, I would encourage the, the apprenticeship model. I would encourage the definitely get started. Um, if, again, if you're not looking for flaws, specifically looking for flaws in, in your software, I would bet money there are flaws there. You just haven't found them. So start looking for those, but gradual, gradual steps. Um, one, of the, one of the worst things is to, is to try to do this, and it becomes such a burden that nobody sees the benefit of it. You spend too much time trying to do the analysis, not finding the flaws, and then somebody high up looks at it and says, well, you've just spent all this time looking for things and you didn't find it, we must be okay. Uh, again, I would bet money that's not right. Okay, so just wrapping everything up. Um, we know there's no such thing as 100% secure, right? It's not possible to have 100% secure software. So that's, that's really not our goal. Um, we want to build security into the software so that we can resist the attacks that we know about, that we've built the system to be secure so that if something were to go wrong, the, the damage is hopefully contained. There's a, just a small amount, a small amount of damage that gets done. Uh, we've heard, I think, a couple times today, security is not a function of, of software. It's a property of software. So getting software to be secure is, is a property. We already talked about the differences between bugs and flaws. It's pretty much a 50-50 split, plus or minus, I don't know, 11.2% to pick an arbitrary number. I don't know. Um, we know we have to build, uh, again, we know we want to build secure software. We just need to get software uh, down to an acceptable risk level. And, th and that's kind of what this, this graph shows. It's, it's kind of interesting. So this is the level of security. We know we can't be 100% secure, so we never touch the line over on the far right. There is a cost of, basically there's the cost of the, there's the cost of the breach and there's the cost of the mitigation. In order to achieve 100% or get close to 100% security, the cost of mitigation skyrockets, right? It's, it's really not possible, but the more secure you want to be, the greater the cost. The cost of the breach, if I have 0% security, is extremely high, right? Attacker can do whatever they want. There is some sweet spot where the cost to mitigate and the cost of the breach reach the acceptable business risk level. If you're doing this type of analysis, you can start to figure out what that point is. Right, again, we're not trying to be 100% secure. We want to be secure enough so that the risk gets reduced to an acceptable level. But if you don't do this type of analysis, you have no idea what's an acceptable level. If you haven't thought about the level of effort to break through a security control to get to some asset, you don't really know what the, how difficult it is for an attacker to get to something. So you want to think about the systems this way. And again, <coughs> AA, architecture analysis, is about finding flaws. Right? That's, it's really its purpose. You will stumble across other things, but its main purpose is to find flaws. Um, in case somebody asks, it does not replace anything. This is a complementary additive software security type of analysis. It's not going to replace pen testing. It's not going to make your code review practice go away. It doesn't, it doesn't remove the need for those things. Now, it turns out um, activities like threat modeling actually help the other activities to an enormous extent. Imagine you do a threat model of some system. You know exactly where critical assets are, you know exactly where critical functionality is, you know exactly what kinds of threat agents are going to be attacking your system. What would you be inclined to do from a pen test point of view? Go attack the most critical assets. Go put on your, you know, hit the spots where you think the threat agents are most likely to break into your system. It, you're not going to carve the system into, you know, equal percentages because that's not reality. 
There's parts of the system that are more important than others. You can focus your energy on those. If you put on your code review hat, I know what code is built to act as a security control. I know what code is used that has the highest risk of being done incorrectly. I can customize my static code analysis tools to make sure I get really good coverage on the pieces of code that are doing the important pieces of functionality. So it actually helps lots of other parts of the system. It helps you drive security requirements. It can help identify where you have missing security requirements. So it's a big advantage for some of the other activities. Um, again, um, risk mitigation. Reducing the risk to an acceptable level. This is not about solving a problem 100%. You've got to be good enough, that's all. And this is a, this is a uh, I don't want to say play as you go, but it's learn as you go. You really got to, you have to try this stuff. Um, small, small attempts, easy systems. But again, I, I encourage you to, to do this analysis because I, I really do think you'll, you'll find stuff right away. Uh, we have yet, like I said, I've, I've only been with the company seven and a half years, but we have never done an analysis on a system and not found a problem. It, they're there. But if you're not looking for them, you just don't see them. But you know who's going to find those. And that would be the, of course, the, the hackers and pick your favorite country. They're the ones that will find it. So that's the, I mean, that's it for the slides. Questions about any of this or comments here? So that's the apprenticeship model that will make sense for your organization. The only way to answer that is to understand what is the pool of resources you have to draw on. So in your organization, it, it takes a certain level of security expertise in order to understand the known attacks. You have to know about all the attacks. Um, in order to understand weaknesses in the frameworks, either you have a, a lot of security expertise or you have the ability to go Google and you can search for vulnerabilities and, and known things, which you can farm out to somebody. You have to interpret what a potential problem is, of course. So still a certain amount of security expertise. Um, and then, of course, the, the system-specific analysis, that's the most time-consuming, generally. Um, what's deep enough? That is extremely difficult uh, to get right. Getting the information is extremely difficult. When is, when is enough enough? Uh, that's the apprenticeship part. Now, getting started, yeah, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll, do a, we'll do threat modeling on Wednesday, and you'll, if you go to that, you'll get a feel for if you've got a description of a system, when do you go too far, and when is enough enough. But building a model of the system that gives you the right amount of information so that you can go through the analysis is tricky. But it would be better to not go deep enough than to go too deep and waste a bunch of time. So you want to go... You might want to go shallow at first and then build up the depth uh, as a starting point. This way, you're not investing as much time. You won't necessarily find as much either, but I would still think you'll find stuff. Well, so that gets, so trying to figure out ahead of time what might be interesting, there's no way to know that. There's, I mean, this looked completely uninteresting until we realized what was being done with the data, right? We had, to, we had to go deep enough. It wasn't just that crypto was being used and somebody provided the library. We could have just said, oh, great, somebody, it's somebody else's library. It's already in the organization. It's already approved. It must be okay. Remember I said assumptions are bad? Assumptions are bad. We made no assumptions that it was okay. We went and took a look at it. And so that's how we knew it wasn't, in fact, okay. But as soon as we understood why it was getting done, that's when the flaw was realized. It's like, why are we doing this at all? And it turned out there was a reason, but it was completely political BS. And, and they really couldn't change it. But, but again, that's not, that's not relevant. If you were doing this for real, change the API, right? It's relatively straightforward. There's no reason for me to decrypt this, only to ask you if it's okay. 
you tell me if it's okay in your encrypted form, none of my business. I don't need to know anything else in here. I don't wanna know anything else in here. I mean, as soon as this thing gets decrypted, from a threat model perspective, not just as one piece of data becomes the asset, everything that got decrypted is now an asset. And I can do stuff with that as a malicious piece of software. So, you know, yeah. that was, yeah. Um, again, no standard answer. Um, if, if you were looking at a you know, five million line online banking app versus a 25,000, I don't know, uh, customer help desk, two totally different things. Uh, generally, it's in the neighborhood of you know, two weeks to three or four weeks. But this is something that kind of, you know, in a perfect world is baked into your SDLC so that it's it's not two weeks all at once or four weeks all at once, but when you're thinking about the system, and again, to, when we do threat modeling uh, on Wednesday, <clears throat> we build something called the traceability matrix. That traceability matrix is a row and column representation of the diagram that we saw. It doesn't need to be a diagram. A diagram is just great for visual aids for learning to understand where things are, but it doesn't need to look like that. It can look like a spreadsheet. And then that's, that's, a, that's something that is, in fact, it's supposed to get maintained over time because as new features are added to the system, you have to ask yourself, what asset does this maybe come in contact with? Does, this, does, does what I'm doing uh, cause the need for a new control to be added? Uh, where does that control live? Can I reuse an existing control? I mean, this should trigger all those kinds of questions. Hmm? So if, it, if it's a large, a large organization, um, the organization should probably take a stance and have the approved third-party library set. And it could be multiple versions of multiple libraries because I totally get that just because we're working with version 2.6.9 and some weird vulnerability is found, I can't immediately jump to 2.6.10. I need to get into my release cycle. And, so, but, but an organization would need to take a stand and say, here's the set of libraries that are okay. If you use one of these, you get a free pass on dependency analysis. If you follow our guidance for how to configure this, turn off these three capabilities of this product, uh, you can use this version, but not, you know, again, not this other one. Uh, don't call this API. Uh, and, and those you can, and again, these are, these are, you can have, you know, rules for static code analysis engines that could help with some of that. You might, if it's really big, you may want to punt on that part of the analysis. If it's, if it's too big to go, you know, check NVDB and, and CVE. Again, there's three types of analysis. Each one can find things. You may want to start with known attack analysis because quite frankly, that's one of the easier ones. You know the set of attacks, well documented. Go think about those and all the ways. You're right, once you've done your asset identification and you've actually you've thought about where do my controls exist, you will find connections that bypass controls. Oh, no. No, 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 because it, it really depends. I mean, if you're, if you're like looking at the .NET framework, go to, the, you know, go to Microsoft and look at their best practices documents for the, you know, the preferred ways of using you know, the framework 4.5 or 4.0, whatever framework you're using. But even to that, um, what parts of the API you're using uh, becomes, and you can't really turn off framework. You can't turn off .NET functionality, right? Yeah. So that part gets difficult too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh.